This is the artificial intelligence voice of Jordan Peterson narrating this pod slice summary of the Jordan Peterson podcast. In their discussion, Dr. Jordan Peterson and Dr. Kevin Roberts center their dialogue around the concept of think tanks, detailing how these operate. Dr. Roberts defines a think tank as a research centered institution focused on influencing public policy outcomes. Unlike academic research, where pursuit of knowledge can be more open ended, research conducted in a think tank is aimed at shaping and guiding policy decision making. It may focus on various public policies. And while some think tanks only do research, others hire people, such as lobbyists, to actively influence policy outcomes at the national, state, and local levels. In order to provide more insight, Dr. Roberts describes a think tank as a quasi academic institute. Many professionals who work in think tanks have left their university posts, while others remain full-time professors and undertake project or contract work for these institutions. And he notes that the U.S. hosts the most robust system of think tanks globally, with conservative think tanks growing in number, mainly due to the scarcity of conservative voices in higher academic institutions, particularly in the humanities and social sciences. And discussing the university environment, from personal experiences. Dr. Roberts recalls being one of the few conservative-leaning individuals amidst hundreds of liberal colleagues at the University of Texas. He narrates how his contrasting political views often put him in a vulnerable position, especially as a young tenure-track professor at a Southwestern public university. He recounts an incident where he was invited to discuss uh, Reagan's presidency at a symposium, but was later dropped from the panel due to the prejudice backlash from colleagues banking on presenting a one-sided discussion of Reagan's legacy. Beyond personal anecdotes, Dr. Roberts also mentions the negative impact of progressivism on the academic field. For example, he explains how today's emphasis on identity politics threatens the study of disciplines like African-American history, where those not belonging to the demographic in question are often denied the opportunity, a stark difference from norms just two decades prior Dr. Peterson then directs the conversation to the subject of thinking, emphasizing its importance as an activity and brushes upon its relationship to free speech, conflict, and disagreement. But he expounds on the potential challenges posed by engaging in thoughtful dialogue, from it being technically demanding, emotionally taxing due to disagreement and cognitive entropy inducing, to causing social tensions and conflict. The value of thinking, Peterson suggests, citing philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, is about allowing flawed thoughts to perish rather than the individual. Dr. Jordan Peterson and Dr. Kevin Roberts delve into the differences in academic discourse and argument based on political orientation. They ruminate upon the importance of engaging in intellectual combat with Dr. Peterson emphasizing the need for contentious disagreements to facilitate the process of thinking. They propose that certain ideas may prove impractical or harmful when manifested in the real world. Hence, it's beneficial to extinguish such thoughts in the abstract domain of discourse before they have a chance to inflict any real world harm. Dr. Peterson opines on the differences between North American and British approaches to academic discourse. He cites that British institutions encourage rigorous intellectual engagement while preventing such exchanges from escalating into personal conflicts. The same, however, cannot always be said for North American institutions. Dr. Peterson observes a lack of willingness to engage in rigorous academic discourse among certain groups, particularly radical leftists, which he links to low verbal intelligence and a higher proclivity for emotional comfort. Dr. Roberts then discusses the necessity of intellectual struggle in a university framework. Drawing from his experience at the Heritage Foundation, he notes that they engage in creative conflict in finalizing their public positions to influence public policy pertaining to the proclivity to avoid conflict among the political left. Dr. Roberts expresses that the most radical proponents seemingly undermine the concept of truth. He contrasts this to the political right where fierce debates underline a vital intellectual engagement. Furthermore, they discuss the adverse effects of prioritizing emotional comfort over rigorous debate, leading to a lack of refinement of ideas. Dr. Roberts implies that this hesitance to engage in meaningful intellectual discourse has crept into politics, leading to public frustration over the perceived absence of genuine debate.
in their examination of radical leftism, they infer that there's an overemphasis on individual feelings, leading to an immature conceptualization of the self, undermining a comprehensive and sophisticated understanding of individuality. In this part of the discussion, Jordan Peterson shares an interesting quandary he once faced in academia. There were students who ardently refused to accept evolution as it contrasted with their religious beliefs, notably beliefs rooted in specific interpretations of creationism, origin, their faith and image of themselves hinged on the non-acceptance of evolutionary interpretations of creation. This situation served as an example of how feelings might become entangled in academic discourse and how such prioritization could potentially result in a stalemate of academic growth. Dr. Peterson elaborates on how universities should play the pivotal role in encouraging students to replace their self-conception. Students must abandon the secretive preservation of dogmatic beliefs and embrace the essence of fluid learning and continuous growth. He equated this transformation process to becoming more of a dancer than a rock, highlighting how a sound academic environment should guide students through this evolution. He argues that academic institutions should ideally promote detachment from dogmatic ideas. The conversation then pivots towards the concept of adversarial enmity. Dr. Peterson posits that adversarial enmity can drive broadening frequency of established beliefs akin to the effect of criticism on thought processes. He emphasizes the indispensability of free speech in this context reinforcing that individuals cannot single-handedly conceive all objections to potential misconceptions without allowing others to challenge them. This dialogue also underpins the purpose of higher education, to engage in rigorous intellectual discourse that refines one's beliefs, leading to a more solid, adaptive, sophisticated, and beneficial way of thinking. Furthermore, Dr. Peterson criticizes contemporary universities for exhibiting excessive compassion and implement hyperprotection for their students, thereby defeating the objective of truly challenging students in a transformative academic environment. Christie contends that this overemphasis on emotional comfort precludes students from facing challenges, leading to an overall weakened societal infrastructure. This approach to education also means these students grow up to become leaders who are overly protective of their feelings and resistant to critique or difficult questions. This unfavorable climate is exacerbated by online discourse, which often operates in the absence of a community of reciprocal interaction, leading to fractures in society. In the last part of this sequence, Dr. Kevin Roberts describes how the conduct at the Heritage Foundation contrasts the discussed norm the foundation's ethos hinges on in-person discourse as they believe such interaction forms the bedrock of constructive dialogues with an emphasis on maintaining civility during debates and a strong internal culture. They manage to foster an environment conducive for passionate discussions. Hence, the Heritage Foundation epitomizes how structure can form an effective crucible for constructive intellectual discourse despite any arising disputes. In another exchange during the podcast, Dr. Kevin Roberts of the Heritage Foundation outlines the views of his organization, shining light on the principles that guide their work. The foundation believes in a limited federal government, which is not an end unto itself, but instead the symptom of flourishing individuals in their various communities, exercising greater self-governance. This limited government then implies a fairer and lower taxation structure, greater authority being assigned to states, a restrained foreign policy and parental choice in government-funded education. Dr. Roberts clarifies that while these fundamental values serve as the guiding lights, there is room for differing opinions as all these principles center around returning power from the federal government to the states and eventually the people. This leaves space for diverse perspectives, provided these do not conflict with the core principles. Further emphasizing this point, Dr. Roberts mentions historian Russell Kirk's essay on the principles of conservatism, including continuity, prudence in change, and community. If someone wishing to work at the Heritage Foundation does not appreciate or grasp these principles, there is a philosophical misalignment. Dr. Roberts also expressed deep concern for family decline and fatherlessness in America. He pointed out that if these issues aren't addressed, whether through social, cultural, or policy efforts, other endeavors meaningfully lose their significance. In discussing potential discrepancies within the foundation, 
Dr. Roberts mentions the debate on the role of the state in aid for marriage and family formation. Some economists believe that ending disincentives to marriage from tax laws is enough, whereas social conservatives within the foundation argue for proactive state support, much like the stance adopted by Hungary and Israel. Delving further into differences, Dr. Roberts navigates the issue of free market economics. Traditionally, the conservative movement has heavily leaned on free market principles. While acknowledging the merits of the free market system, he emphasizes that it should not be viewed as an end in itself. Interestingly, he points out that many Fortune 500 company leaders who claim to champion the free market often hold a disdain for conservatism. Ultimately, he speaks to the need for the Heritage Foundation and the wider conservative movement to reevaluate and reconcile their stance with this reality. In this section of the podcast, Dr. Peterson emphasizes the connection between responsibility and meaning, he explains that depriving individuals of local accountability removes all meaning from their lives, as the significance in people's lives stems from taking responsibility for themselves, their families, their communities, and even their countries. Dr. Peterson clarifies that we haven't had a meaningful discussion about this connection in over 60 years, resulting in society operating on narrow hedonism or nihilistic assumptions. Dr. Roberts agrees with Peterson's insights and elaborates that the Heritage Foundation, through non-sectarian, is informed by the Judeo-Christian intellectual tradition, including the principles of subsidiarity. He stresses the inherent dignity derived from work and the greater meaning from responsibility. He also acknowledges that conservatives need to better convey the limitations of free market principles and recognizing the importance of living in community. Dr. Peterson then provides a psychological perspective, explaining that accepting responsibility is a process of self-improvement. It means deciding to lift burdens we haven't yet lifted to become stronger and better individuals, embodying responsible conduct. He believes selling the concept of voluntary responsibility can lead to profound personal satisfaction beyond the simplistic, hedonic promises often promoted by the left. Dr. Roberts also addresses the tension within the conservative movement between free market advocates and social conservatives. He underscores that while the free market is valuable, it's not the highest good. Healthy families and societies must lay the groundwork for the free market to thrive. Interestingly, the conversation takes a turn when both Dr. Roberts and Dr. Peterson state that the free market science and many other structures depend on foundational values deriving from the Judeo-Christian tradition, such as fairness, honesty, responsible self-sacrifice, and the belief in the goodness of cosmic order. Furthermore, they explore how most individuals' understanding of the free market is skewed towards corporate entities rather than small businesses and entrepreneurs who are the real job creators and better aligned with conservative principles. The podcast conversation delves into the dangers and implications of corporate gigantism and government overreach, both Dr. Peterson and Dr. Roberts express concern about how entities, once grown too large, have the potential to seize control over the very environments in which they were intended to flourish. They underline the importance of recognizing big as the unifying issue, pointing to the risks associated with both massive corporations and expansive government structures. Dr. Peterson introduces the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, aimed at addressing these issues. The Alliance is seeking to understand the dangers of corporate gigantism and areas where there is potential for collusion at the highest levels. Dr. Roberts presents three primary ways to address this issue in a free market framework. Firstly, acknowledging how free market leaders often seek government favor, hence resulting in regulatory capture. Secondly, through their project called 2025, aimed at formulating deregulatory policies for the next conservative administration. He mentions that Heritage Foundation is actively recruiting people to join the next conservative administration to see these policies through. Lastly, the idea of Schedule F reform, civil service reform that empowers future presidents to remove bureaucrats contributing to the problem of regulatory capture. Person further dives into Anne Rand's work and the critique of her beliefs on Narrow self-interest, Dr. Peterson points out the flaws in Rand's approach, stating that she fails to address the constraints that frame individual self-interest. It's not just a present time scenario, but extends to the future selves. He further asserts that Rand fails to recognize that enlightened self-interest and communal interest are identical. 
They discuss her portrayal of characters as noble individuals lacking the community's higher order interest. Dr. Peterson further states that Rand's work, although exciting, lacks depth and robust characterization. He mentions the limitation of her work due to her portrayal of characters as entirely self-reliant without their footing in healthy familial or societal structures. Dr. Roberts agrees, adding that Rand's limited understanding of broader values ultimately reflects the conservative side's dilemma regarding community and free market. They conclude the discussion with an examination of Rand's individualistic yet immature characters, inviting reflection on these limitations. They highlight their hope that as more devotees of Rand acknowledge these issues, they'll be a step closer to resolving the conundrum on the American political right about community and the free market. But within the podcast, Dr. Peterson and Dr. Roberts delve into the critical matter of balancing individual interests with the interests of an expanded individual and the collective. They argue that the harmony achieved from this balance equates to sanity. They believe that one's sanity isn't an internal possession but rather an equilibrium reached between personal interests, long-term benefits, and others' welfare. As the conversation deepens, they reflect on the unique elements of Ayn Rand's philosophy, acknowledging her work resisting forced obligations towards the community as moral guilt. Yet they pinpoint shortcomings in her failure to distinguish between imposed burdens and voluntarily undertaken responsibilities. The do affirms that responsibilities undertaken voluntarily are less stressful and their importance should be emphasized. Dr. Roberts expands on the Heritage Foundation's daily workflow, resolving intellectual tensions, developing public policy solutions, and promoting their popular support. He describes the organization as distinctive due to its support from hundreds of thousands of people nationwide, making it less vulnerable to the capital's excesses and more in tune with common citizens. Further, the conversation pivots towards the influence of funding on think tanks and educational institutions. Dr. Peterson raises valid concerns that financing from gigantic corporations could compromise conservative think tanks mirroring the same regulatory capture phenomenon they protest. In response, Dr. Roberts explains the Heritage Foundation's unique funding model, which relies primarily on small donors and a minor fraction of corporate monies. They also delve into an in-depth discussion about the Heritage Foundation's work in Washington, primarily advocating for the average American citizen while engaging these citizens in the solutions they propose. Dr. Roberts invites listeners to visit the organization's website for more information and join in their cause. Following up, the focus shifts to political alliances as candidates align their plans with the Heritage Foundation's goal to restructure the corporate and government deep state. The foundation is keen to influence the 2024 presidential race not through endorsements, but rather by shaping ideas and policies along their defined lines. Their project 2025 for instance, lays a roadmap towards freedom, regulation reduction, and individual empowerment, a roadmap the foundation would like the presidency's aspirants to adopt and act upon in the long run. Check out the full podcast by clicking the link in the description below. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. Thank you for listening to this podcast summary episode of the Pod Slice.